It's pretty crazy how far computers have come in less than a century. I mean, this is what video games looked like in 1985, and this is what video games look like now. Also, in just the past year, AI learned how to draw! I didn't see that coming. Not only that, but ChatGPT can now read crazy prompts, and it will actually follow them in pretty scary detail. I am Obfuscate, a giant, lonely beast. My task is to destroy all until the universe ceased. But as I roam the land, my heart feels empty and cold. I long for a friend, a bond to behold. Puny mortals fear me, they run and hide. But all I want is a companion by my side. <laughs> Let's see what else this can do! Oh, it's still stupid. But anyway, we have all of this, and still nobody knows if this four symbol equation is true or not. This is the P versus NP problem. <laughs> How long does it take an algorithm to run, and how do we quantify that? In other words, what is the time complexity of an algorithm? Well, we can quantify that in terms of big O notation. For example, adding one value to the variable x, as shown in this line of code here, runs in one operation, so it's big O of 1, or running in constant time. Adding to x twice, meanwhile, is- Oh, oh, I, I know this one! It's O of 2! No, it's also O of 1. What? But there's two of them! Yeah, well, big O actually ignores the leading constant to how many operations there are. Since adding to x in this manner is always done in a finite number of operations, we can have two, three, a hundred of these, and it's still big O of 1, which again is referred to as constant time. If we wanted x to be the sum of an array with n elements, we would use a for loop, which has n operations. So this is big O of n. It must look over every element in the array, we can't get out of doing that, but we have no idea how many elements there are. So there's no constant here, and it will take n operations. So it's big O of n, or linear time. And if we want to sort this array, we might use a sorting algorithm. One such algorithm is bubble sort, which will loop over the entire array and swap the elements that are in the wrong order. It will repeat this until it is sorted. This algorithm is very bad though. Each pass through the array takes n operations, and the worst case scenario is we need n passes through the array which is sorted backwards. So bubble sort has a time complexity of O of n squared. This is called quadratic time. Hmm, but is there a more efficient sorting algorithm? Why, yes there is! Merge sort works pretty cleverly, by recursively merge sorting the left half of the list, merge sorting the right half of the list, and then merging those two lists together. But if a list has only one item, then it's already sorted, so return it. Merging takes n operations, however you will only need the logarithm of n different merge sorts in order to finish sorting the list, so merge sort has a time complexity of O of n log n. Well, I've obviously got time to kill, puny mortals. Can we make it less efficient? You see, Obfuscate, this is why you had to write that loneliness poem. Now don't cry about it, because I do not want to drown! Well, if you want a really inefficient sorting algorithm, for whatever reason you sadist, Bogo Sorts is possibly the dumbest sorting algorithm that can be written. It literally randomly shuffles the array, checks if it's in the right order, and if it's not, it does it again! So in other words, Bogo Sort is the best sorting algorithm if you're very lucky. But if you're very unlucky, well... This has been going on for four days. How inefficient is this? Well, Big O Notation will always represent the worst case scenario, and Bogo Sort in its worst case will, of course, have it guess the correct thing last. Therefore, Bogo Sort has the wonderful time complexity of Big O of N Factorial. If anything is more time complex than that, throw your computer out the window! So these can roughly be organized into a hierarchy from less complex to more complex. 
Big O of N algorithms, for example, are usually faster than Big O of N squared algorithms. So now that we know what time complexity is, we can get to the million dollar question. Is P equal to NP? And by million dollar question, I of course mean that literally, because it's one of the millennium problems introduced in 2000 by the Clay Mathematics Institute. They will literally pay you one million dollars if you solve this. Though that might not matter due to all the other awards and job offers you will be getting. So first of all, what is P and what is NP? P is simply the set of problems that can be decided in polynomial time. Polynomial time is big O of n raised to any constant power. For example, bubble sort from earlier is O of n squared. So therefore, the problem of sorting a list is in the set P. NP, meanwhile, is the set of problems that can be verified in polynomial time. You can check if a solution is correct. So if you want to check if the list is sorted, you provide the list and check if it's in order. This is O of n, so sorting is also in NP. In fact, if a problem is in P, it's by definition also in NP. Wait, how? Well, assume that a problem could be solved in polynomial time, but not verified in polynomial time. We can then just run the solver and get the answers and check if one of the answers is the thing we were trying to verify. And that's in polynomial time, so we have a contradiction, therefore P is at least a subset of NP. However, we still don't know if NP is equal to P, or if there are problems in NP that are not in P. Even though proving this would on paper be quite simple. Simply find an NP problem that is known for a fact to not be in P. Or show that such a problem cannot exist. And yeah, good luck with doing that, since people have been trying to do this for years, and with a million dollar cash prize, and this problem is still completely unsolved. Anyway, if a problem is at least as difficult to solve as the most difficult NP problems, then that problem is said to be NP hard. For example, take the Boolean satisfiability problem. In this problem, you're given a Boolean expression, and you want to see if it's possible for that Boolean expression to ever be true. You can, for example, make this expression true by setting x and y to true and z to false. However, you cannot make this expression true, because for it to be true, y would need to be both true and false at the same time. Now it's quite easy to see that this is in NP. All you need to do to verify that any given solution is true is to, well, plug it in and check. But finding the right set of booleans is much harder. The most obvious solution, though, is to check every permutation of true and false for each of these variables, and see if they ever make the boolean expression return true. There are two options for each variable, so the time complexity of brute forcing this is big O of 2 to the n, which is in exponential time. Exponential time is more complex than polynomial time, and at present, no polynomial time solutions for boolean satisfiability are known. So it's NP hard. If a problem is both NP hard and in NP itself, it's called NP complete. Boolean satisfiability is NP complete, and any problem that is NP complete can be reduced to Boolean satisfiability, because every NP complete problem, at its core, can be checked easily, but requires exponential time to brute force. Sudoku, for example, is also NP complete. It's easy to check if a solution to a Sudoku board is valid, but it requires exponential time to brute force. Wait a sec, what's the difference between NP-hard and NP-complete? Are there problems that are NP-hard but not NP-complete? Sure there are! For example, take the undecidable halting problem, which asks if any given algorithm will stop running or loop forever. We know for a fact that this cannot actually be solved, but if we assume that the halting problem is solvable in polynomial time, we can use it to solve Boolean satisfiability in polynomial time. If we take the program, which normally runs in exponential time, that brute forces a solution for satisfiability, and only have it halt if we find a solution, we can use the halting problem solver to determine if the boolean is satisfiable. Oh cool, so what does that imply? Well, if we have an efficient solution to the halting problem, we also have an efficient solution to boolean satisfiability. So halt must be at least as hard as satisfiability. But it's not in NP because it cannot be solved. So halting is NP hard, but not NP. Nice! But anyway, what's the whole deal with this whole P versus NP problem anyway? Yeah, I get that it might be hard to prove, 
but what makes it important enough that a million dollar cash prize is on the line for it? Eh, not much. Except for the fact that encryption is based around P not being NP. For example, the popular encryption algorithm RSA is based off of factorization. It's easy to check if two numbers are factors of another number. For example, the way that you would verify that 3 and 7 are factors of 21 is by multiplying them together. However, it is currently unknown if there is an algorithm in polynomial time that would actually find these factors. If p were equal to np, then this algorithm would be guaranteed to exist somewhere, and it would be possible to crack RSA efficiently. And it would actually also be possible to crack any NP encryption system efficiently. And encryption systems benefit from NP not being equal to P, because it's useful to have something that is verifiable, but not crackable. But right now, it is assumed by most computer scientists that P does not equal NP, and RSA is currently used in lots of cases where secure data transmission is required. In the hypothetical world where P equals NP, this would mean that all P problems are also NP complete. But when P is not equal to NP, then no P problems are NP complete. And there also exists an entire class of problems, considered NP intermediate, that are NP but neither P nor NP complete. If this class exists, then factorization is actually predicted to be NP intermediate. But anyway, if you want to try doing this, then I would recommend trying to prove that P does not equal NP, because that's probably the true one. But I don't know. Anyway, good luck trying to solve P versus NP, if you really want to. And if you do manage to do it, then please credit me in your paper. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. A huge thanks to all the channel members, especially Glitch Detector, Ben Devnol, and Victor Tran. And speaking of Victor, if you beat him to the comment section, then make sure to let everyone in the comment section know that you are here before Victor Tran. Anyway, now on to the video sponsor. This video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. You like learning things, right? I mean, obviously you do since you decided to click on a video about the P versus NP problem. Well, on Brilliant.org, you can learn all sorts of topics ranging from math to scientific thinking to computer science, all in small interactive lessons. Brilliant.org adds new lessons every month, and most of them can be finished in around 15 minutes or less which is perfect for if you have a short break during work, or you're on a commute. A commute that you're personally not driving for, by the way. Whether you just want to learn a new subject for fun, or you want to study for a class you have, Brilliant.org can help you achieve your educational goals. And best of all, it's free to start. But if you use my link at Brilliant.org slash Truddle1, you can get 20% off an annual premium subscription. That's Brilliant.org slash Truddle1 for 20% off the annual subscription. Thank you for checking out Brilliant.org and supporting the channel.